And we are recording. So I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today. Welcome to the CNCF webinar, Stork, Storage Operator for Multi-Cloud Deployments. I'm Kim McMahon on the CNCF marketing team, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. We'd like to welcome our presenter today, Dinesh Israni, Principal Software Engineer at Portworks. A few housekeeping items before we get started. During the webinar, you're not able to talk as an attendee. There's a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, so feel free to drop your questions in there, and we'll get to as many as we can. Dinesh will be answering them throughout the webinar. The, the session is being recorded and will be sent out afterward along with a link to the presentation. Now with that, I'll hand it over to Dinesh to kick off today's presentation. Hey, um, thanks. Thanks for giving us the opportunity to uh, present about stock today. Uh, so let's get started. Um, so I'm going to present um, um, ab about an open source project uh, that we started at Portworks called Stark, um, which is basically a multi-cloud uh, operator for managing your uh, storage uh, to run your stateful applications. Uh, my name is Dinesh Israni, and uh, I'm a principal software engineer at Portworks, and I've been at Portworks for uh, roughly two and a half years now. Um, so this is the agenda for the talk. So first I'm going to introduce Stark and uh, what it is and what it does. Then I'm going to talk about what the motivation for Stark is. And uh, then uh, we'll go to the different features uh, that Stark provides. Uh, basically, uh, how, we, uh, how we use Stark to schedule your stateful services more efficiently and how it can be used to monitor your storage, uh, storage solutions. Then we'll talk about how Stark can be used for uh, different types of disaster recoveries. Basically, how you can take snapshots back backups of your applications and how you can migrate, um, migrate your applications between clusters. Uh, and if there's time, I'll also do a demo and um, then we'll move on to the Q&A section uh, if, there's, if there are any more questions towards the end of the seminar. But you can always ask uh, questions uh, while I'm presenting and uh, uh, I'll answer them as they come up. Um, so, so an introduction about Stark. So uh, Stark was uh, started and maintained by Portworks, uh, which is a software defined uh, solution um, for built for Kubernetes. So it, it basically helps you manage your data um, uh, for container workloads. Um, it is an open source project and it's available on GitHub um, under Apache 2.0 license. So Stark was started in uh, November 2017 and we went GA in January 2018. Uh, since then, we've had uh, 20, 23 releases, minor and major, and uh, the next 2.3.0 release is scheduled for the end of July. Um, so these are just some of the adopters um, that, that are actually using stock right now, either in production or uh, in pre-production. Um, uh, there, there are a few more users, uh, but um, I just wanted to put out some of the uh, uh, users that are actually using them right now. So uh, let's talk about uh, the motivation for Stark. So uh, when we started off Stark, um, one of our motivations was to basically to help uh, people run their stateful applications more efficiently on Kubernetes. Um, so basically the storage uh, uh, subsystem in Kubernetes is built in a very generic way. So there is no real way to uh, run uh, high, uh, stateful applications hyper-converged if you're running a software-defined uh, soft, uh, storage solution on Kubernetes. And also there's no real uh, native way to monitor the uh, state of your uh, stateful apps that are using software defined storage solutions. Um, we also wanted a way to basically help users manage the entire lifecycle of stateful applications. Um, so Stark helps you take application consistent snapshots and it also helps you migrate your applications between clusters. Um, and we've also added um, uh, features uh, to basically back up your entire data and your Kubernetes resources. So basically uh, to help you back up your entire applications into an external store and then restore them in case of a disaster scenario. Um, so the, um, also um, Stark is built on a plugin model. So uh, we have uh, support for the Portworx uh, storage driver, but uh, the way it is built, uh, it can actually be extended to work with any storage driver. There is, there is a very, uh, there is an interface that is used by all the different components. And as long as you implement that interface, you should be able to use any of the uh, uh, features of Stark. So uh, let's move on to the first feature that Stark provides. So, um, so when you're running a software defined storage solution, you want to basically make sure that your apps, 
your pods are scheduled on a node where your data is basically located uh, locally. Um, this is this for multiple reasons. Um, first of all, this uh, provides better performance because all your reads and writes will actually be serviced locally instead of going over the network. Uh, the second thing is it actually uh, reduces network congestion uh, because if you're using a software defined solution, um, software defined storage solution um, and your data is actually located on a different node, you will actually end up using uh, network bandwidth, which could, uh, uh, which could have adverse effects on your applications as well as your storage solution. Um, so, so how does, uh, how do people actually uh, use, uh, how do people do this uh, without stock? So the, the wide uh, uh, variety uh, of uh, solutions basically use uh, labels and affinity rules on their applications. Um, there, are, there are a couple of issues with this. Uh, first of all, it, it doesn't really scale. Uh, you have to make sure that all your applications are actually using, all your applications as well as your PVCs actually have the same labels. Um, and you need to make sure that all of them actually have this to make sure um, uh, things are getting hyper converged. Uh, the other thing is this, this is obviously error prone. Uh, what if you forget to put these label selectors or uh, affinity rules on your applications? In that case, um, everything will work fine. It just won't be uh, hyper-converged. Um, another major issue with this is that uh, it doesn't really work with stateful sets because in stateful sets, you're not, um, since you are only able to specify a PVC, PV temp, PVC template name, you aren't able to associate the PVCs that are automatically created by stateful sets. Um, to the pods that will be using those PVCs. So you're not able to specify unique uh, labels uh, for both the PVCs and the pods uh, using stateful sets uh, if, you, if you were to use labels and affinity rules. Um, so, so our solution was to basically use uh, st scheduler extenders um, that is built into Kubernetes. So um, there, there was a feature added into Kubernetes to uh, have an external component running as an extender. And what happens in that case is every time a pod is to be scheduled, it actually makes a few API calls to the extender to help, help it make decisions on where pods should be scheduled. So uh, Stark has basically, uh, there are a couple of verbs that you can basically implement in your extender. Uh, and Stark has implemented two of these. So the first the first uh, f um, verb that uh, Stark has implemented is basically uh, the filter uh, verb. And what this does is it basically filters out nodes where your storage isn't available. So I'll go into detail into uh, what this does in the next few slides. Um, but think of it this way, right? So if you have um, um, a 10 node uh, Kubernetes clusters and you have your storage solution installed only on five nodes, now you obviously don't want your um, pods to get scheduled on the five nodes that does not have your storage solution. So this filter verb will basically work in, in stock to filter out the nodes where, where your storage solution is not installed. Um, the other verb that has been implemented uh, here is the prioritize node. Uh, what, what this does is it basically, uh, for each pod that is to be scheduled, it basically checks where the where the volumes are located for that uh, for that pod, basically where the replicas are located, and then uh, depending on that, it basically prioritizes the nodes where the pods should be get, should be scheduled. So this takes uh, this takes uh, into consideration a couple of things. It's not just the node, but it also makes sure uh, in case you don't have resources on the node, it then prioritizes nodes on the same rack then uh, racks on the same region and uh, basically also zones. So it basically makes sure that your data is closest, uh, your pods get started closest to where your data lies. Hey, hey Dinesh, we yes. do have one question. Um, sure. Does the underlying, underlying container technology matter? And, and then further, uh, he asked, so this is based on the container storage interface specification? Um, so I'm not sure uh, about the first part, but uh, so like I mentioned, everything is basically an interface. So if you mean the storage solution, this can actually be extended to work with any storage solution. Um, if you meant whether it works with Docker or ContainerD or anything, it will work with any of the uh, container runtimes. Um, about CSI, so uh, this does not use the CSI APIs directly because uh, the CSI APIs don't have support to give, get all the information over here. So what happens is since everything is implemented as an interface, um, all the different components make API calls to the interface and then the port works 
implementation of the interface makes API calls to to Portworx in this case. But um, we could also have a CSI implementation of the driver as long as CSI uh, provides all the information back for, for the different modules to work. I hope that uh, answers the question. All right, so um, the advantage of uh, using um, this scheduler extender is that it's 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 very simple to use so you don't have to worry about making sure that your labels on your pvcs match your applications and that you have set up your anti affinity rules or affinity rules correctly on your applications all you need to do is uh, you just need to configure your scheduler name to be the uh, new instance of the scheduler that you've started um, and actually you can uh, you can also configure your default scheduler to work with the extender um, so in that case you don't have to make any changes at all so as long as your scheduler is made uh, is configured to talk to stock, you will automatically be able to provide hyperconvergence for your stateful apps. Uh, the other way is you can basically start a new uh, instance of the scheduler and call it any uh, call it stock for instance, and then use that in your applications. Um, so we had also added support for um, for uh, for a feature called initializers in Kubernetes. Um, what this would do is every time you would actually create a stateful set or a deployment, the initializer would then go and check if it's using a PVC that is supported by stock. Uh, basically the provisioner is supported by stock. If it was, it would automatically go and update the scheduler name so that you would get hyperconvergence. Um, but initializers actually got deprecated in uh, Kubernetes uh, 1.14. So we are looking at other ways to uh, provide this automatic update for the scheduler name in your deployments and stateful sets. Um, so this is basically how, um, um, how the filter verb would work for, um, for when, you're, when a pod is trying to get scheduled. So for example, uh, every time a pod is uh, going to be scheduled, um, the Kubernetes uh, scheduler would, uh, would basically see uh, that a new pod has been created in the uh, API server. Um, and at that point, uh, one second. yeah, at that point, it would basically send out a filter request to Stork. Now Stork would basically talk to uh, the storage solution. Uh, in this case, I've shown an example of how it would work with Portbox. It would basically talk to Portbox and figure out on what nodes uh, the storage solution is uh, installed. So for example, when a pod is to be scheduled, it will actually tell Stork that um, uh, I have these five nodes, N1 to N5, and then Stork will basically talk to the storage solution and figure out that, that the storage solution is installed only on N1, N2, and N3. And then it would basically filter out N4 and N5 and send back only N1 to N3. Because those are the only nodes where the pod can actually get scheduled if it wants to use uh, the storage solution. Um, now, once the filter uh, request uh, has, has gone through, the Kubernetes scheduler will then send a prioritized request to uh, Stark. Now, since we have filtered out N, N4 and N5, it will only send um, N1 to N3. And it'll then tell the extender, these are the three nodes where I want to schedule my pods. Can you please, please prioritize the nodes where these should be scheduled? Now again, Stork will basically figure out where the replicas for the volumes lie. So for in, in this uh, example, uh, the pod that is to be scheduled is actually using two volumes, V1 and V2. Uh, and from the diagram, you can see that um, two replicas, uh, these are basically volumes with two replicas, and uh, the replicas for V1 lie on N1 and N2, and the vol replicas for V2 lie on N2 and N3. Now obviously over here, if you schedule the pod on N2, you will get the best performance because both your volumes V1 and V2 are located locally. So uh, Stark will basically send um, an API call to the storage driver and ask for it where the volume replicas lie. Um, once it gets that information, then it'll basically score the different nodes uh, uh, based on how many uh, replicas each, each node has. Um, so for example, in this case, what will happen is it'll basically uh, rate N1, uh, it'll give N1 a score of 100, N2 a score of 200 since it has both the replicas, and N3 a score of 100 since it has one replica for uh, one of the volumes. Um, and at this point, uh, the Kubernetes scheduler will realize that uh, N2 has the highest uh, priority uh, and uh, start the pod on on node N2. Um, so basically, um, this is uh, this will end up uh, hyperconverging the pod with the data, and all the I/O that will happen will basically happen locally on the node. Hey Dinesh, can you? Yes. We have a couple questions. Um, sure. 
the first one, does Stork run as a sidecar? Uh, so Stork itself runs as a deployment. We just start, uh, uh, we started, um, so typically we started as a three replica deployment and one of them is, uh, we run a leader election and one of them is the leader. So uh, we run this in a three replica mode so that it's, it fails over quickly in case one of the replica fails. Okay, and second question, how does this integrate with PVC? Um, so, the, so there are a couple of things, right? So the stuff that I'm talking about right now where the scheduling is happening. So the PVC is already being created. So for example, for um, either Portworks or any of the other uh, uh, storage solutions, you will either have drivers in tree in Kubernetes or you'll basically uh, either use flex volumes or an external provisioner or CSI provisioner to provision the volumes. So there is no provisioning happening over here as such. All this is doing is every time a pod comes in, it sees what PVCs are being used by the pod. And then it basically talks to the storage driver to get more information about that PVC. And then uh, it basically schedules the pod closer to where the volumes for that PVC lie. So it's using the PVCs, but it's not really manipulating any of the PVCs over here. Okay, and the third question, how is it different or similar to Rook? Um, so Rook is basically um, an installer for, uh, for different storage solutions. Um, so Stock does not actually do any installation of any storage solution. It is just orchestrating data and making sure your, st uh, your stateful apps run more efficiently. So it is not doing uh, an actual install of Portworks or any of the storage solutions. It's just making API calls to the different port, uh, to the different, uh, for the different features to basically orchestrate all these things. Basically make sure everything's uh, hyper-converged and uh, uh, what I'm gonna talk about next is monitor the health of your storage solutions and uh, basically DR snapshots and backups. Okay, well we have a couple more uh, questions still. Uh, this works like a tiller like Helm? Uh, no, so Helm again is is the one that will be um, installing the apps. So this is not installing any of the apps, right? So you might actually use Helm to um, to install, for example, a Cassandra chart, and at that point, it will it'll either install a deployment or a stateful set, which will spin up pods. Now, once these pods are going to be scheduled, that's when Stork will actually kick in because the scheduler is then basically going to try to schedule the pods on different nodes and it'll basically make API calls to, to start to figure out where it should be scheduled. So again, this is not installing or installing any of the apps. It's just helping you uh, run your apps more efficiently. Okay. Um, what is PX on the slide? Uh, so PX is uh, basically Portworks. So I'm just showing an example of um, of Portworks running as a storage solution on this cluster. Okay. Um, can the storage be SAN or NAS? Yes, it can be any storage solution as long as Stark has support for uh, that driver. Okay. Uh, question from David. This is just for pod alignment to volumes for performance. Uh, yes, so this feature is basically for performance to make sure that your pods lie close to uh, where your data is located. Okay. Is Stork in the data path? No, Stork is not in the data path. It's only in the scheduling path in this, in this uh, scenario. Okay. Uh, on, what basis on what basis volumes are created on the worker nodes? Um, so again, uh, stock does not uh, participate in the actual provisioning of the volume. So, for, so in this case, what would happen is you would actually uh, create a PVC and say Portworx is the provisioner for that PVC. Once you apply it, uh, the entry driver for that uh, PVC would go ahead and uh, go ahead and provision the volumes. So, stock is not in the provisioning path in this case. Okay, and this may have already been answered, but in case of Stork, how the PV gets created in storage, every PV needs PVC, and for dynamic provisioning, we need provisioner and storage class? Yes. So again, that's, that's outside Stork, but yeah, when you create a PVC, you would basically first create a storage class and put the provisioner over there. You would provide the different options you want for the, uh, for the PVC, and then refer to that storage class in the PVC. Once you create the PVC, it would basically talk to um, whoever the provisioner is. So it could be the entry provisioner, it could be flex volumes, or it could be the CSI provisioner. And at that point, it'll basically create, uh, it'll basically talk to the storage solution 
create a volume and then bind, create a PV and then bind the PV to the PVC. Now stock kicks in only after all of this has been done and you are actually scheduling a pod to use the PVC that has been created. Okay. Is there any value if you are not stuck on internal disk? Uh, there is still value. Um, uh, I'll talk about um, um, what other uh, features uh, you can use basically, but um, even if you're not using local disks, um, there is still value in the sense you, so you can do a couple of things over here, right? I mean, right now the prioritization is happening only based on where data is located, but uh, there could be scenarios where you want to make sure that you don't overwhelm um, even if you're using network attached storage, right? You don't want to use, you don't want to attach a lot of network attached uh, disks onto one uh, one node. So you could basically do a couple of things where you try to spread out those pods uh, based on uh, the density of the, uh, you, you can spread out the pods on different nodes depending on uh, how many how many storage, how many disks you have attached on a particular node. Okay. Yeah. So another comment here. So Stork is basically an extension to the Kubernetes scheduler that helps it schedule pods properly, correct? Uh, that's right. For stateful applications. Yeah. Okay. How is Stork being managed while updating the Kubernetes cluster in terms of workload availability? So Stork will not... Um, Okay, I'm I'm not sure what uh, what that question means, but if you upgrade your Kubernetes cluster, um, that will not affect um, uh, any of this, right? So it all depends on how Kubernetes is actually doing the upgrade, right? So as long as pods don't uh, get uh, deleted or rescheduled, there will not be any impact as such. Um, and since Stark is act Stark itself is running in a three replica deployment, if the node where uh, the leader is running goes down, you'll still be able to schedule pods since two of the other replicas of Stark will still be up. Okay. And we have quite a few questions coming in. Do you want me to keep asking them or? Um, I, I, have, I have quite a few slides to cover. So maybe we can uh, uh, move them uh, out and maybe have uh, questions about some of the other features as we move on. Yeah, I'm wondering if some of your other slides might answer some of the questions coming in. So uh, we're going to proceed for a little bit, keep the questions coming in, and we'll get to them uh, in a couple more slides here. Okay, cool. So um, I'm going to move on to uh, basically the next feature of Stark. So uh, one of the challenges with running stateful applications on uh, Kubernetes is that there is no current, there is no way right now for Kubernetes to monitor what the, what the health of your storage solution is because each storage solution actually behaves very differently and you don't want to add all of that logic into the Kubernetes score, right? So, uh, and all, all is good when everything is online, right? So um, you, you won't really see any issues, but um, dealing with failures with, uh, dealing with failures is actually difficult, especially when there's state involved, uh, because what if your storage driver goes offline, right? And this could happen for a couple of reasons, right? Storage degrades um, as you use it, right? So. Basically, what if what if your disk go bad um, and you're not able to uh, perform I/O on the disk where the pod on the node where the pod is actually scheduled? Um, also, since since the storage solution is actually a soft uh, is a separate component that might actually fail or uh, be crashing, right? And if you have pod scheduled on a node where this is happening, what happens in that case? Um, so what typically happens um, uh, for storage solutions uh, for software defined storage solutions is Kubernetes won't really know um, if if storage has gone bad on that node, right? So, uh, Kubernetes just monitors the the health of Kubelet um, and some other system level parameters to make sure that there is enough CPU, memory, and things are not basically going out of whack. Uh, but as long as Kubelet is healthy and all the other resources are available, if storage on your on one of your nodes goes down, Kubernetes is not going to know, and it's not going to basically reschedule your pod so that it basically spins up on some other node. Uh, what will happen in that case is your pods will actually get stuck and depending on your storage solution, either it will not be able to serve IOs or it will go into a degraded mode. And uh, this, and, and, and for some applications, uh, even health check doesn't uh, really help uh, because um, in scenarios where the app is actually up and it's not able to talk to the storage solution, the health, the, uh, health check actually uh, returns fine too. So what's going to end up happening is your, your, stateful application is not able to make any progress, but Kubernetes is also not able to reschedule uh, the pod because it doesn't know that something is actually stuck in the, in the application. 
um, and for stateful apps or for stateful sets, actually, there is there um, there is uh, there are there are a couple of more issues because stateful sets actually behave differently than deployments. Uh, stateful sets actually, if something goes wrong on a node, it does not automatically re reschedule uh, pods because uh, it, it's got a stickiness towards towards a node. So in that case, uh, even if something does go wrong, for example, if Kubelet actually crashes on one of uh, your nodes, it will not actually reschedule the pod onto another node. So, so what ends up happening in these scenarios is you actually end up uh, having to manually intervene and reschedule your pods so that your application is, is up and running. So what stock does is it actually monitors the health of storage um, on all the nodes. So periodically it basically makes an API call to the storage solution and checks whether storage is uh, healthy on all the nodes. Uh, and if it actually goes offline, it actually lists out all the pods that are using uh, storage from, uh, from that storage solution and then reschedules the pods. Um, so the advantage of this is, uh, for example, if you're using a storage solution that is actually doing block level replication across nodes, even if, even if uh, it, the storage solution goes down on one node, it will automatically figure out that storage is down on this node. I have pods running on this node using this storage solution, which will likely get stuck at this point. So it will delete the pod and make uh, which will basically reschedule the pod onto one of the other nodes. So your applications are then basically uh, are available right away in, in, even in case uh, where things are crashing. Uh, without this, what would happen is pods would uh, either get stuck in uh, pending states since they're not able to access storage because they won't be able to uh, either write to the, write to this or uh, mount uh, mount the volumes. Um, like I mentioned, for stateful sets, this also deals with scenarios where uh, Kubelet um, actually uh, is offline on a node. If you don't have this, pods will actually just uh, get stuck in uh, basically the Kubernetes node will go into a node loss state. And your pods will also get uh, stuck and they'll not get rescheduled because Kubernetes will still be waiting for Kubelet to come back up on that node. So this is, uh, this is how um, uh, it works um, uh, architecturally. So uh, basically every, uh, so stock is basically polling, uh, in this case, uh, the Portworx service to check if Portworx is healthy on all the nodes. Um, and it is basically, um, so, so in the previous example, we had actually uh, scheduled um, the pod on node two. And in this case, if uh, node two actually goes offline, it will, uh, it will see that uh, PX is down on node two and it'll uh, delete the pod in that case. Uh, now, once the pod gets deleted, uh, the uh, controller basically, whether it's uh, the replic, uh, the deployment controller or the uh, stateful set controller, it'll see that um, the pod needs to get rescheduled and it'll again talk to stock to figure out where the replicas of the volume lie and try to uh, try to schedule the pod on one of the replicas. Now, as in the previous example, since um, both N1 and N3 just have one replica of the volumes, it will basically start um, the vol it'll basically start uh, the pod on either N1 or N3 since both of them are going to remotely access one of the volumes. So in this case, the pod got started on node um, N1. And uh, since V2 is not available locally, it's basically doing a remote mount of the volume and using that for the pod. Yeah, there's a typo here. This actually starts it on N1 and not on N2. Okay, uh, I'm going to move on to uh, the disaster recovery uh, part. Just a quick Well, I, I wonder yeah. if maybe we should jump into a couple of the questions. Is that okay? Yeah, sure. Yeah, let's do that. So, I don't know if I'm saying your name correctly, but while he, he has a couple, does this work for Kubernetes on VMs or bare metal or bo both, or does it even matter? Um, it works on any Kubernetes um, uh, deployment. So it'll work in the cloud, it'll work on-prem, it'll work in VMs, it'll, um, it'll, and it'll work for any Kubernetes distro. So it's, it's um, all independent of that, yeah. Okay, and while he has another question, does Robin Systems address the similar use case? Um, as far as I'm aware, uh, they do not. Okay. Yeah. And the third question, how does scale out handle with Stork? Um, scale out of pods. So pods again, uh, so again, Stork is not involved in scaling out any of the applications or basically, uh, doing, uh, 
uh, basically scaling out in case you need uh, uh, basically auto scaling. So if your application actually gets auto scaled, for example, uh, if you're using any kind of auto scaler and it decides that it needs to spin up more pods, at that point, stock will come into play uh, when the pods are getting scheduled. Um, before that, stock does not do auto scaling of either pods or your storage. Okay. Um, from our anonymous attendee, if storage is external, not in the Kubernetes nodes, what would be the role of stork? Will there be a, any benefit? Um, yeah, like I mentioned, so you can always use stork in cases where you don't, you want to make sure that your, um, your network attached storage, um, disks are spread out. So what you can do is, for example, if you have five nodes, you want to make sure that, uh, and you have, and you started like 15 pods, you know, you want to make sure that all your 15 pods don't get scheduled on one of the nodes, right? So you could basically do things like monitor on how many, uh, how many mount, how many disks have been mounted on one of the nodes and then basically load balance uh, the mounts on different nodes. Okay. And I think you should go back a slide for Anthony's question. What if N2 and N3 nodes go down? Don't, we go by three node. Isn't there a three node approach to avoid data loss? Uh, yes. So in this, in this scenario, uh, obviously, um, if you have any kind of storage solution, you want to make sure that, uh, your, uh, you have a quorum of nodes up. So if in this scenario, if two, if two of your nodes go down, you, uh, you, you will basically lose a uh, quorum for your storage solution. So at that point you will not be able to, uh, schedule any more pods. Okay. Yeah. Uh, is this just for pod alignment to volumes for performance? Uh, yes. Okay. What storage backend is Stork already compatible with? So right now uh, it's compatible with Portworks. Um, uh, but like I mentioned, everything is abstracted out. So as long as you implement an interf uh, the interface, you should be able to use this with any storage solution. Okay. Yeah. Anonymous has you have a lot of questions. You should connect <laughs> connect with Dinesh when you're done. But uh, here's another one: if if I have a Gluster file system and the PVR created on the Gluster nodes and not the application nodes, how how will Stork work or schedule it? Um, so, sorry, can you repeat that? Anything? Yeah, he uh, he's talking about a Gluster file system and mm -hmm. the PV are created on the Gluster nodes and not the application nodes. Okay. How will Stork work and how will it schedule? Um, so it'll still work in the sense, uh, so you might, so the other uh, advantage over here is, um, so if you're saying that your cluster nodes are running only storage and they're not doing any, uh, you don't want to schedule any pods over there. Uh, what you can do is if you actually place labels and have information on which rack they are located. So what you, what Stork will do is it'll actually prefer um, nodes it'll actually prefer nodes on the same rack where your cluster FS nodes are. So it'll actually provide you better performance in that case. So you are actually reducing bandwidth uh, network usage even in that case, because you're not uh, sending data across racks. Um, so, so if you implement a cluster FS um, uh, driver over here, you will be able to take advantage of things like uh, that in your data center. Okay. We have two more here. How does Stork work when horizontal scaling is enabled since the volumes are predefined on certain nodes? Um, if horizontal scaling is enabled, uh, what will happen is actually new pods will be created and new PVCs will also be created. So in that case, um, basically things will get spread out. So, um, uh, uh, let me talk about how Portworks would work in case of Portworks. If you horizontally scale your applications, your, um, it is basically going to uh, create new PVCs also, right? And the PVCs themselves are going to get spread out. So by that consideration, your, uh, your pods are also going to get spread out to make sure that your uh, cluster is evenly used. Okay. Uh, do you have to feed the storage and host configuration the stork or does it scan and determine that once deployed? Um, so you don't need to feed anything. The only thing that you need to do here is set the scheduler name as stock in your deployment um, or stateful set. So there's a field in the spec. You just need to set that to stock and then everything happens automatically. Um, there, there, there are a couple of specs that you have to apply to actually install stock. But once that is done, all you need to do is set the scheduler name in your applications. Okay. And I believe you're going to start talking about DR and snapshots and things like that, correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. That's what so I'm we'll hold on this last question here. Go ahead. Okay, cool. 
So, uh, so what I was talking about previously was basically how you can run um, applications more efficient, stateful applications more efficiently on Kubernetes, as well as how you can manage and uh, 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 basically uh, monitor your st uh, storage solution so that your apps are always running even in case of failures. Um, so what I'm going to move to next is basically um, uh, DR scenarios. So um, all that I talked about previously is good um, for your day one scenarios, right? But as you move forward and you move into production, uh, production, you want to make sure that your applications are actually product uh, protected. And uh, if things go bad, you are able to basically recover your applications. Um, uh, yeah. So, um, so there, there was an, uh, when we started this, there was a way to basically, uh, there was a need to manage lifecycle for uh, storage natively in Kubernetes. Um, so the storage solutions provide ways to basically take backups, but there's no native way of doing this in the sense you can't, there was no way of uh, uh, basically applying specs in Kubernetes to uh, take snapshots or uh, take application backups or do migrations. So that is what uh, Stork has uh, 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 started building on too. Um, so when it was started, there was no native support for snapshotting PVCs. Um, right now there is, um, um, there is a CSS snapshotter, but again, if you are using, uh, either flex volumes or any of the entry drivers, there is no real way of, uh, taking snapshots of PVCs. Uh, so what we did in, uh, start was we basically added support for this. And this was based on a project that was uh, started in the Kubernetes incubator. Actually, uh, there was, uh, there was something in the external, uh, external, um, ex uh, external volume, um, um, external storage project in the Kubernetes incubator that had a snapshotter. So we basically uh, use that to uh, build uh, snapshotting capabilities um, in uh, Stark. Um, so this also works over a group of VCs. So for example, if you have a distributed app like Cassandra, Kafka, or MongoDB, you can actually give label selectors to select what group of labels you, a group of PVCs you want to snapshot together. And this actually takes uh, application consistent snapshots. I'll talk about uh, how that is done um, at a later point. Um, and so uh, right now you can basically take snapshots, um, snapshots of your uh, PVCs. Um, uh, but in 2.3.0 version, which is releasing end of July, we'll actually add support to um, back up your data as well as your uh, application resources to um, an object store. Um, so what would happen in that case is you would specify a backup location, which could be any S3 compliant object store, Azure Blob or Google Cloud Storage. Um, and what that will do is it'll basically back up all your data as well as all your resources to that object store. Now, in case your, uh, your cluster goes down, you just have to spin up a new cluster, uh, create a, a backup location that is pointing to the, to the same object store, and you'll be able to restore uh, your, your application, uh, including your uh, data as well as the resources to, uh, to a new cluster. Um, yeah, like I mentioned, uh, we support um, any of these uh, three object stores. Um, um, so the, so yeah. let me... So we have a, a couple couple different questions. What are the parallels with Valero for snapshots? Do they complement? Um, so the uh, so the, the, a couple of things, right? So snapshots themselves over here uh, they take snapshots of only the PVCs. So uh, the application uh, uh, the new feature that we are talking about in two dot three dot oh, which is basically backing up your data and the resources, is similar to Valero. But um, what we've uh, kind of uh, paid more attention to over here is to give more access to users. Um, so for example, in Valero, you can only, um, it, it's more geared towards admins where you can only create uh, backups and restores from one namespace. Um, in Stark, what we've tried to do is give more, uh, uh, allow the users of the apps to have more control actually. So over here, uh, the way it works is as long as you have access to uh, your namespace, you will be able to basically take backups and do restores of applications over there. You don't really have to talk to a storage admin who's managing your entire cluster to uh, take backups um, and stuff like that. So it is similar, but um, I, I think we, uh, we uh, kind of behave a little more differently to give more, uh, more power to users uh, in this case. Okay, and David has a question. He thinks this might be outside of Stork scope, but can you set priorities based on disk type? For example, are you um, storage based on SSD, HDD latencies due to the faster disk type IO? Hence, you can prioritize pods to node two because it's all SSD. 
Um, yeah, uh, that's right. So this is not um, not a part of stock because when stock comes into play, the volumes have already been provisioned actually. So this is more um, um, more a thing of the storage solution. For uh, for example, I can talk about how this works in Portworks. Um, in Portworks, if you have different types of this, they basically get uh, uh, put into different pools. And when you're actually creating PVCs, you can actually specify which pool you want to uh, create the PVC in. So once that is done, once the PVC is created in the in the appropriate pool, at that point, Stork will just schedule a, schedule the pod onto the node where the pool exists. So that that decision of uh, where the data, which pools or which type of disks the storage gets uh, allocated on, it happens even before Stork comes into play. Okay. And Anthony has a disaster recovery related question. How does that work in the case of geo redundancy use cases? Um, so uh, I'm not sure. Uh, so there's, there are a couple of scenarios in, uh, in case of geo redundancy, redundancy also, right? So, um, the way it works, uh, I mean, the, the, you could use this in multiple ways, right? So for example, if, the, if you're doing this in the cloud and you have a cluster in AWS, say us East one, uh, you could basically have all your apps running over there and you basically uh, take regular backups into S3. Now, once, uh, if, if there is an outage of uh, the entire US East region, what you could do is you could spin up your entire um, cluster in US West and then point it to the same, uh, same uh, S3 location and basically do a restore of your entire app over there. So that is one of the scenarios that you can use uh, application uh, uh, basically backups over here. So I'm gonna talk about how you can actually do migrations to keep, your, to keep two clusters across uh, regions in sync too. And that's, that's in uh, the next uh, slides. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so uh, the next uh, kind of disaster recovery sub, uh, feature that we provide in uh, Stark is that we actually have support for multi-cloud or multi-cluster migration. So what you can do in this scenario is you can actually um, uh, pair two clusters and then migrate all your applications between two clusters. Um, so there are a couple of uh, uh, use cases where you would, where you would use this. Uh, one of the uh, use cases is where you want to augment your current cluster. So you might have a cluster with some, some amount of resources, um, CPU, memory, storage, and you're running a couple of apps over there. Now, as you start onboarding more users, you might realize that some of your apps are taking up a lot more resources and you don't have enough resources um, on the cluster to basically start up more apps. And at that point, what you might want to do is you might want to migrate a couple of your apps onto uh, another cluster. Now this is very simple to do with state, stateless apps, right? You basically scale down your you scale down your apps on your source cluster and just spin it up on the destination cluster, and everything's good. But with data, there is there's some kind of gravity involved, right? How do you move your gra how do you move your data as well as your resources together? So that 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 is what uh, that is the support that we've uh, actually added in stock. Uh, the other uh, scenario where you want would want to use uh, migration is where you want to do some kind of blue green testing. So for example, if your storage solution has a new version uh, release, you want to make sure that your apps and everything works fine before you actually upgrade. Um, so in that case, you would basically have cluster one running with V1 you would sp and, and a couple of apps running on uh, the cluster one. Right? So then you spin up cluster two, you would install uh, V2 of the storage solution and then you would migrate all your apps and then make sure everything is fine. And then on your production cluster, basically uh, upgrade everything uh, once, you, once you're confident that everything is running fine. Um, the third scenario is in cases of dev test. So you might actually hit a, pro, uh, a bug in production uh, that can be reproduced only with data that's running in production, right? Um, now before fixing it, you, you might want to run some tests to make sure that the, the bug is actually fixed. So how do you do that? So um, th th that is one of the use cases over here where you can basically uh, migrate that particular app from your production cluster into a separate cluster, run a couple of tests with the updated app, make sure everything is fine. Uh, and then update your uh, production cluster. So um, how does this work? So uh, first what you do is you basically, you can pair two or more clusters. So what this does is it basically pairs the storage solutions on both the clusters, as well as the Kubernetes uh, uh, orchestrator on both the clusters. Um, and this can actually be any type of Kubernetes clusters, right? So it can be on-prem, it can be running in VMs, it can be any kind of managed cloud like GKE or AKS. Um, and it can even be any other distribution of uh, Kubernetes like OCP or PKS or any of those uh, uh, distributions. Um, 
yeah so once the uh, so i'm actually going to show a demo of this if we have time so uh, once once the two clusters are basically paired then you can start migrating uh, applications across this so all you need to do is specify the namespace that you want to migrate and you can actually specify uh, label selectors in case you have multiple apps running in a namespace you can select only a few of the apps that you actually want to migrate between uh, between two clusters uh, and once you apply those specs uh, stork will then talk to the storage solution to migrate your data between the two clusters, and then it'll basically migrate all your resources between the two clusters. So these resources include stuff like your deployment, stateful sets, config maps, uh, secrets, um, and we also have support for some of the OCP uh, CRDs like templates, routes, uh, and image streams. So what this does is it basically gives you an exact copy of your application um, on another cluster, no matter what cloud it is, uh, no matter what cloud or uh, 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 kind of uh, Kubernetes cluster it is running. Okay, we do have a couple questions before you get to the demo. Sure. Uh, from Wahid, is the Portworks storage solution appliance based? Do you need to buy the hardware from Portworks or can you just buy the storage software and run it anywhere? Um, so Portworks is completely software defined. So um, it's um, there is no uh, hardware involved. So it can basically you can install Portworks on any hard um, on any hardware. You can actually so we are cloud native in the sense you can actually install us on prem on VMs or any uh, of the cloud services. Okay, and when he had a follow on question, Portworks is for container only. Can uh, can he provide block or, or sorry? Can they provide block and file to the VMs? Um, so. Portworks is built for containers, uh, but you can um, obviously manually orchestrate. And um, so Portworks by itself is actually providing a virtual block storage solution, uh, virtual blocks, uh, block devices. So you can obviously manually orchestrate all of that to provide uh, uh, volumes to your VMs as well. Okay. Yeah. Does it work with storage OS? Uh, stock does not work with storage OS right now. So uh, like I mentioned, Portfox is the only driver that's implemented, but you can implement uh, a driver for any storage solution. Okay. Um, yeah. Neil, I'm not sure I got your question. Um, how does this help in disaster recovery, warm, hot site scheduling to historic leaders on a warm, hot site? Yeah, I, I don't understand how uh, I understand the question either, but um, so there are a couple of... <laughs> Yeah, so uh, another shot and we'll go to Anthony's question. Um, how does the data migration work from a non stork deployment to a stork deployment? Um, so the destination doesn't require stock to be running at all. Um, it's just the source cluster. So everything is basically being orchestrated from the source cluster. So it, it basically handles all the migration. It basically migrates all your data as well as the resources onto the destination. So you don't have need to have stock running on the other uh, cluster, but obviously, if you want your uh, applications to be scheduled more efficiently, you would have stock running. On, excuse me, on both the clusters. Okay, so we'll wait for Neil to give an, um, more clarity to his question. If you want to go ahead and go to the demo. Um, sure. Uh, so let me just walk through two more slides really quickly. So um, all of this uh, stuff that you're doing for disaster recovery, you obviously don't want to do them manually. You want to uh, schedule them on a periodic basis. So for example, if you're doing migrations or snapshots, you want to make sure that uh, they are either done daily when you have some downtime in the cluster or weekly or monthly. Uh, so we have support for that too. We basically have uh, CRDs defined for schedules for each of the different types of disaster recoveries that you can do. Um, and the other thing is, if you are actually doing any, uh, performing any of these operations, you want to make sure that they are basically application consistent. In the sense, uh, if you're running uh, distributed apps, you want to make sure that your databases are uh, are locked or all your, for or for example, for your Cassandra or uh, Kafka application, you want to make sure all your data is actually flushed to the disk before you uh, perform these operations so that you have the latest data available uh, uh, for your, when you have a disaster. So we actually have support for uh, running rules before and after your uh, before and after the applications for example for a mysql you can actually lock a table um, uh, flush all your data lock a table and then take a snapshot and then unlock it and for cassandra for example you can flush all the data from the memory before taking a snapshot uh, and we also have support for uh, so we also have a tool called stock curl to easily manage uh, all the custom resources that we've defined so for example you can actually just create a snapshot uh, simply by just running this command. So you can do stock curl, create snapshot, the namespace and the name of the PVC and the name of the snapshot and it creates a snapshot. And if you do a get on the snapshot, you'll basically see the snapshot uh, that has been created. 
And similarly for the cluster pair and migration, you, you basically get a lot more information if you use Stalker. So um, I guess we have eight minutes left. Uh, I'm just going to switch to my uh, terminal right now so that I can show you a quick demo of the migration. So uh, in the interest of time, I have actually spun up uh, two clusters um, and I've, uh, so uh, this, is, uh, this is my destination cluster and this is my, this is my source cluster. So on my source cluster, I basically have a, a MySQL app running uh, through a deployment as well as uh, a service, right? And if I do a get PVC in this, You'll see I also have a PVC created that is being used uh, by, uh, by MySQL. Now, uh, I've already created a cluster pair between these two nodes. So if I do a Q, uh, stockle get cluster pair in the MySQL namespace, you'll see that I have a, uh, a cluster pair created, uh, created and the storage uh, is ready as well as the scheduler is ready. Now to migrate, um, so you can use stock turtle to actually uh, spin up the migration too, but I'm just going to show you what the uh, CRD looks uh, or the custom resource for this actually looks like. So um, this is the cluster pair that we actually created. So that is the name of the cluster uh, uh, that we created, which is pointing to the other cluster. So uh, we are actually telling it that we want to include the resources when we um, uh, do the migration. And I'm, um, I had actually initially said this to false, but I'm just going to say that once the application actually spun up on the destination cluster, I also want to start the applications. Now, if you set this to false, what it's going to do is it's actually going to uh, migrate uh, the deployments, but it's going to spin down the uh, replicas to zero. Because uh, I don't know if that, that was the question that um, the person previously asked, but you might have scenarios where you actually have active and standby clusters, right? Uh, and you want the application to be running only on the active cluster. Um, so in that case, you will actually set this to false. That would basically migrate all your data, migrate all the resources, but spin down the application. And then you can basically, in case of a uh, disaster, go to your standby cluster and spin up the applications. So here I'm um, actually, let me just set this to false. So I'm going to say false to say that uh, you should migrate everything, but not spin up the applications. And then this basically says the list of namespaces that I want to migrate. I'm say, just saying that I want to migrate uh, just the uh, MySQL namespace. So I am just going to apply uh, that spec and I'm then going to watch I'm just going to watch the status for the migration so uh, what you're going to see uh, happen here is basically uh, it goes through a different stage uh, different stages uh, during the migration so first first it's going to migrate all the volumes and then it's going to migrate uh, the application resources so uh, once this kicks in you'll see that the stage actually goes into volume um, and if you see over here uh, on the destination, there's nothing really present right now. And uh, as you can see over here, the, the migrations for the volume actually started up. Um, and in a few seconds, you're gonna see that this is going to complete and then it's going to migrate all the applications, application resources. So while we're waiting, we do have a, a question. Is there a UI for this? Um, so there is um, not through stock, but Portworks, separately has a UI. So there is no Stark, uh, there's no UI in the project itself via Stark. But uh, Portworks has a UI called Lighthouse where you can actually trigger it from there. Okay, uh, are we still waiting? Um, yeah. Let's see, I got a couple more questions then. Uh, do you have a preference, oops. Uh, do you have a preference for underlying disk types? HA HHD, SSD, L flash, and VME, et cetera. Um, no, all of that depends on your application. I mean, uh, for Portworx, as long as uh, Portworx gets a block device, it'll basically form a clustered store, a clustered virtual storage pool uh, across that. So you don't, it, the type of disk doesn't really matter as long as it's an unformatted block device that's presented. Okay, so follow on to that. Does it support persistent memory storage? Um, again, as long as it, is presented as a block device and you want to make sure that uh, yeah that, as long as it's, per, uh, uh, is, it's presented as a storage as a block device virtual uh, as a raw block device it will work yes okay yep so uh, as you can see over here uh, it went through um, so the stages went through really quickly so from volume to applications to final so here it basically says that it migrated one volume and eight different resources from cluster one to cluster two and if you go to cluster two right now 
you'll see that um, all the resources are actually present over here. Um, and if you look at the deployment, you'll see that the uh, replicas are actually set to zero. That is because we said that we do not want to start the applications on the remote node. Now, in case of a uh, DR scenario, once your cluster goes down, all you need to do is run stock, stock kernel activate migrations and give it the, the namespace uh, where you want to activate it. And it'll basically spin up the replica count to uh, uh, what was on the source cluster. The way this works is if you do a kubectl describe on the deployment, you'll see that uh, stock actually put um, a, uh, an annotation saying what the number of replicas were on the source. So this allows you to basically scale it up uh, once your, uh, once your uh, once your uh, active cluster goes down. And if you do a get all on this cluster, you'll see that um, the pod is basically up and running over here. And if I do a kubectl get PVC in the MySQL namespace, you'll see that the same, uh, the same PVC and the same PU are actually created on the destination cluster as a source cluster. Yep, um, I think uh, that's about it from me. Uh, actually, let me. Yeah, just... we, we still have questions coming in. So, can you go to the slide how uh, people can get a hold of you? Uh, and yes. I encourage uh, of the questions that we didn't get to that you they contact you directly. So, yes. go to that slide. Yeah, this one. Okay. Yeah, so. Uh, uh, yeah, so uh, here's, uh, here's a link to uh, basically the project. Um, like I mentioned, we are, uh, it's an open source project on Stark and we welcome contributions for any drivers uh, and features. Um, there are a couple of blogs that have more technical detail about, uh, uh, about uh, the features that I pointed to. to. Uh, and my contact information is here. Uh, if you want to contact me, uh, so it's uh, disrani at portfox.com or my uh, GitHub is uh, disrani-px. Uh, and uh, you can also always get in touch with us on uh, the Portbox Slack channel. Okay, well, thank you. With that, we, we are out of time. There were some questions, so I encourage you to get in, co in contact with Dinesh. And thank you all for joining. This presentation will be uploaded to YouTube later today, and I believe Dinesh is sending me the slides, so we'll get those on the CNCF website. Thank you, everybody, and have a fabulous day. Thanks, everyone. Bye.